Hello everyone, welcome back to International Trade. I'm very excited today to begin a two-part lecture on the topic of offshoring. And this lecture is going to be made of uh, several parts. We're going to start with a short history of globalization. Uh, this has the objective to put offshoring in uh, a historical perspective, historical context. And furthermore, it is very important if you take an international trade course that you learn very briefly about the history of globalization. Then we're going to try and uh, apply the actuary model that we started a few weeks ago on uh, the topic of offshoring. And uh, we're going to see that that model is not going to do very well empirically. It's going to fail to replicate certain patterns in rising income inequality across countries. And for such reason, we're going to need a new model. Right? That's going to be the model by Finstra and Hanson. And uh, uh, that's going to help us understand how offshoring can account, partially account for the increase in income inequality in the US and in Mexico. Then we're going to study another model of offshoring, the so-called trading tasks by Grossman and Rossi Hansberg. And we're going to finish with uh, another model uh, this is going to be uh, just a description of a model, we're not going to see any math there, of sequential production. And we'll conclude with a look at the data and in particular at a study of offshoring in Denmark. Everything I'm going to tell you in the next few slides are taken from this book, The Great Convergence by Richard Baldwin, which if you're uh, looking for uh, uh, some literature something to read over the summer, I recommend you that book. Also, you may want to look up the author because he has given some great presentation about COVID and the economy, if you're interested in. But so there is pretty much a consensus that there are three uh, or maybe four uh, eras, ages of globalization. So if we look at uh, an estimation of uh, trade costs, Right from uh, uh, 1830, 1820 till uh, 2015. Well, you can see here, this is a, a plot from an article by Fouquet and Hugo, 2016, where they estimate sort of an average uh, trade cost. Right? So how much is it, how expensive it is to export a good from a place to another. And this obviously is an average across countries. And what you can see here is that there has been a steady decline of these trade costs uh, since the 1820s up until World War I. Then there is an increase in cost, subsequent reduction, increase again during World War II. And then uh, we're basically back on that downward trend uh, that began in 1820. Right? Now, this is a very simple way of thinking of globalization. We're thinking of our globalization as a reduction in trade costs. Right? Now, historically, we can define four different eras. There's the first era, which is the first globalization. This is uh, coincides with the uh, with the uh, industrial revolution and the subsequent developments. Now, that is stopped by World War One, and then there is an interwar period where a sort of globalization is on on pause. Then after uh, World War II, we have a second globalization. And then since the 90s, we have a third one, which has taken predominantly the shape of offshoring. So very briefly, let's talk a little bit about the first globalization. This is a golden age of globalization. Now you can imagine that, you know, you probably remember from uh, your history classes uh, in uh, high school, I presume, that there were a lot of technological progresses, uh, railroads, steamships, combustion engines later on, the telegraph. Right? So very various uh, innovations in uh, transportations. They basically allowed uh, for the transportation of goods, right? which were being produced at higher and higher productivity, right? uh, thanks to the Industrial Revolution. Along that, there was also uh, policies uh, uh, that helped uh, 
promote the globalization, right? lower tariffs. Uh, I mean, this is an era in which uh, it was a wild, wild held belief uh, that the laissez-faire economy, so letting uh, the economy do what it what it does, letting the markets free, was a good idea, right? And uh, for instance, uh, within the British Empire, there was a free trade of uh, of goods. Now, thanks to this technological progresses and policy changes, we had uh, this first globalization, which was very easily modeled with our actual in or with our Ricardian model. So countries specialize in their comparative advantage goods and they export. In the interwar period, well, it is obvious when you think about wars, when you think about uh, the subsequent, uh, you know, the protectionism that arises uh, during war, and also uh, the interwar period, all these uh, fascist states in uh, in Europe that promoted a strong idea of nationalism, and so that uh, you know everything that uh, say Italy had uh, wanted to consume, well, they should have produced it uh, themselves, almost in an autarky situation. And you can clear that it's obvious here that there is not much globalization. But after World War II, things change. The development of containers and the subsequent growth of ports, they were able to handle these containers. You can see here in the figures the port of Aarhus was actually instrumental in the growth of international trade uh, after World War II. And this is very important that you know it because it's quite astonishing how a simple technological innovation such as the container, you know, a metal box uh, that is put on ships was instrumental in uh, reducing trade costs, facilitating international trade, and uh, in particular, uh, reducing the, uh, the, the need of workers on uh, ships and on ports and reducing the risk that these workers on ships would uh, pillage, would take part of the uh, shipment for themselves. Now, along with the containerization, uh, there were also other you know, technological progresses. Obviously, we're not shipping, you know, since the 1990s, we were not shipping goods the same way we were shipping goods uh, before World War I, obviously. And on top of that, uh, there were also policies that promoted free trade. Uh, we have the experiment of the European integration that began with uh, agreements on uh, carbon and steel and then evolved uh, into what is today the European Union. And then it was also the uh, general agreement on tariffs and trade, uh, which became in the 90s the WTO, which promoted reduction in tariffs worldwide. And again, this promoted trade, uh, we're going to see that part of this trade will be explained very well by models that we're going to study in, uh, in a week. But basically countries went back into uh, the, the traditional pattern of specialization in their comparative advantage sectors. But then in the 90s, things start to change. Okay? This is the so-called third wave of globalization. And this was uh, driven primarily by two technological progresses. The first one is the ICT revolution, the use of computer and uh, later on the internet, and then the air cargo. Now, what happens with this third globalization is uh, a uh, offshoring. Okay? So the fact that the uh, components of a particular product are made all over the world. So this is also sometimes referred to as global value chains, international fragmentation of production, or trading intermediate goods. So you can think that used to be the case that once you took the raw materials, perhaps from abroad, all the stages of production from the raw materials till the final good were pretty much produced in the same country and oftentimes in the same uh, place within a country. So why would you, uh, how would it be possible to have these production processes to be breaking into pieces and made all over the world? Well, 
uh, when we when you compare a situation in which you're making a product all over the world versus in this in the same place there's two main issues one is an issue of coordination right? so if there is i don't know a problem at a given stage in the uh, production process right? if you're in the same place uh, you probably observe the problem yourself and you can you know walk uh, till uh, the, the part of the factory that's producing the other components communicate that and figure out a solution, maybe halt the production, right? But what if uh, these things uh, are produced all over the world? So you have a factory that produces something in Hungary and a factory that produces something in Denmark. If there is an issue in Hungary and the only way you can communicate is with some expensive phone calls, it is probably very difficult to uh, figure out the solution, figure out what is the best response uh, for the uh, factory in Denmark and so on. And so if you have ICT, if you have computers, if you have emails, if you have all of these things, that is much, much easier, right? And the second uh, technological progress is the air cargo. And so here, uh, the other important cost associated with uh, uh, fragmenting your production process and offshoring some of these intermediate goods abroad is that you may need uh, a large inventory, right? a large stock of intermediate goods. Why is that? Well, you know, if you are producing, uh, say at the latter stage, say you're assembling the components of your products and these components are produced all over the world, uh, you basically, uh, you know, if it takes uh, a month to receive uh, the components from the other factories, well, you probably need uh, stocks of these components uh, in your assembly line for about a month. Right? So that, that's very expensive. That is uh, um, working capital. That is immobilized capital. It's money that you could have invested in something else and it's just sitting there in your warehouses because it takes a long time to ship, ship intermediate inputs from your other uh, facilities all over the world. And so what the air cargo does this is the shipment of intermediate goods uh, via plane that makes the shipment of uh, intermediate goods very, very fast. And so you don't need huge stocks of your intermediate goods because you can always have a new shipment uh, uh, tomorrow or the day after. Right? Now this, was, this became apparent after 9-11. There was... Uh, Basically, all uh, transportation by air was shut down in the U.S. And that actually caused huge problems in the automotive industry. There was relying on uh, intermediate inputs that were delivered by a plane. Right? They were using this uh, uh, just-in-time production that does not use high levels of working capital or stocks. Okay. Excellent. So this produced offshoring. So now let's look at some anecdotes of what this offshoring is. So this is a, uh, perhaps the most famous example or one of the two most famous examples of offshoring. This is the production function for uh, Boeing planes. And you can see from this figure that the various parts of Boeing are made everywhere. China makes something, South Korea makes something, Australia makes something, Japan, Canada. There's also some production in Europe, which, you know, perhaps you may find surprising since Europe is more known for the production of Airbus. Right? Those are the two main uh, competitors in the production of planes. But basically what you see here is that uh, although Boeing is a US company, uh, saying that Boeing is made in the U.S. Uh, is a little bit uh, naive. Right? The Boeing is made in the world. Right? So this, this is a lot of implications, right? Because say Donald Trump imposes tariffs uh, on uh, Chinese products. Uh, well, uh, Boeing is importing some Chinese products for the production of Boeing. So that tariff may actually cause uh, some... Uh, uh, some economic troubles for Boeing because if its intermediate inputs become more expensive, then its plane will also be more expensive, right? Now, another interesting example is that of the iPad. Uh, this probably you know, uh, but oftentimes, uh, especially some years ago, uh, 
a lot of people, myself included, before starting international trade, I was thinking that the iPad was uh, sort of made physically in China and uh, you know, uh, invented in California. But that, that's, that's not what it is. Right? It is designed in California by Apple and then is assembled in China, uh, perhaps also uh, sometime in, in Brazil. But uh, what about the components of the iPad? Well, let's look at some big components here. Where are they made? Well, these are made again everywhere. You see that there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of components are made uh, uh, in China, some in Taiwan, some in Korea. Notice here that Samsung, a competitor of Apple in final products, is actually supplying display modules for the iPad. You also have some Europe here, right? The uh, PCB, which is the printed circuit board is also uh, made uh, in, in Germany and the uh, and, uh, parts uh, of this uh, sensor PCB, uh, whatever that is, are made by ST STM uh, ST Microelectronics, which is an Italian French uh, company. Okay. okay, but so it's actually even more complicated than this because if you look at one uh, main printed circle board, one of these uh, big, components, there's actually a ridiculously large number of small components that make this component that are made uh, by different companies, Samsung, uh, Texas Instrument, Broadcom, and presumably made in different places. And so you can see here, this is, this is quite remarkable. There's a, a very large number of components that are made everywhere. And it's actually quite remarkable that this very complex production function, which again, think about it, it involves people all over the world, different backgrounds coordinated somehow by Apple or by some producers, right? and it all works out and uh, we have the iPads. Okay. Now the last anecdote here is something that I really like uh, because uh, offshoring does not only involve this complex products such as airplanes or iPads, also involves canned tuna. So this is uh, showing you uh, the various stages of production of tuna. You know, after you fish it, you process it into frozen pieces, you do some pre-canning processing, and then you can it, you distribute it, and you consume it. And basically you can see here there are some uh, you know, they, they, they fish tuna in the Pacific, they do some uh, canning uh, process, sorry, the, some um, processing the tuna into frozen pieces in the Pacific directly, then they move to Southeast Asia, they do their some uh, pre-canning and canning processes, then they move to the US where they do the distribution and the final consumption. But you can see here that that is just one uh, sequence of uh, stages, but you can see there can also be made in different places. Okay? You know, they can be made uh, in uh, Central America. The process can start in Central America, go to Europe, and then go back to the US. So suppose that we have two countries, two factors of production. Uh, we're not gonna look at uh, capital and labor anymore. We're gonna look at low skill workers and high skill workers. Also because you can think at, uh, Again, think about uh, the iPad production process. Uh, if you just think about the design and the assembly, of course, perhaps there are some different in the types of capitals used, right? but the main difference is that there is uh, the design of a product that mainly involves high skill workers. It's high skill intensive, in other words, and the assembly line uh, requires uh, relatively more low skill workers. So we're going to think that there are two intermediate inputs, right, which combine the high skill and low skill labor. And then these intermediate inputs are assembled together in a final good. Right? So this is really just the relabeling of the actual model that we saw a few weeks ago. The intermediate inputs uh, are the two goods that in the actual model we were talking about. And the final good that we have here, YN, is nothing else but the utility of the consumers that we had in the actual model.
Okay. Okay, so of course we're gonna have perfect competition. But so suppose that again, good one is high skill intensive, the home country is high skill abundant. So perhaps this is the US, and a good one is the design of a product, the research and development activities associated with it. If we go from other key to trade, what is supposed to happen? Well, in terms of uh, specialization, obviously the home country will specialize partially in the production of the high skill intensive input, research and development, and the foreign country, say uh, Mexico, will specialize in the low skill intensive input assembly. Okay. Now, this is going to be a, a, a good thing overall because that means that you get more output of the final good. Right? But then there's going to be, uh, by the stoper samuelson theorem, there will be some distributional effects. And in particular, the relative wage of high-skilled workers will increase at home and will decline abroad. So high-skilled workers will uh, be better off in the home country and low-skilled workers will be better off abroad. So let's see if that is indeed the case. So how can we measure high-skilled uh, wage and low-skilled wage? Well, a, a coarse way of uh, doing that is to uh, look at manufacturing sector and then compare the relative wage, obviously this is an average, of non-production workers to production workers. So non-production workers are the workers that in manufacturing are not directly involved in production activities. So who are these people? Well, the managers, right? The white collar workers. Whereas production workers are the blue collar workers, those that are actually engaged in production activities. And you may think if non-production workers are managers and production workers are blue collar workers, you can think that uh, non-production is high skill labor and production is low skill. Right? Simply because there is different number of years required to gain the skills, the knowledge, the competencies to work in the two positions. So we can see here that between the 60s and 80s, the relative wage was about 1.55, 1.6. And so this is uh, something like a uh, non-production worker gains 60% more of production workers. And this uh, by 85 more or less starts increasing up to uh, a little bit more than 1.75. And so this is a measure of increasing income inequality because non-production worker, workers who are gaining already more, they become even richer. All right, so how can we interpret this? Well, there is a relative link and increase in the relative demand for uh, non-production workers. So if we have in blue the demand in 79, and in blue, the supply in 79, you can see that to rationalize this pattern of increased uh, relative wage of non-production worker, it means that the relative demand of non-production workers has gone up. This is consistent with actually right? That the US is high skill abundant, starts trading, start offshoring, thanks to the air cargo, thanks to the ICT, specializes in uh, um, high skill intensive good and high skill workers are better off. Perfect. What about in Mexico? What about in the foreign economy? And in the 80s, this is the period in which the maquilladoras really started developing. Those were uh, factories just outside the uh, Mexican borders and intermediate inputs would go to Mexico from the US. They would be uh, quickly processed, uh, be some uh, value added to them, and then ship them back to the US. So what is going on in Mexico? Are low-skilled workers being better off? Well, let's see. Again, here we have a relative wage of non-production workers to production workers in Mexico. You see here, they start at a relatively high level of three. So see, managers earn uh, three times more than blue-collar workers in 64. Then there is a decline in this measure 
But then my 85, uh, where we started this uh, analysis, the relative wage of high skilled workers increases. Ha. So the actuary model is wrong. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Right? High skilled workers are getting richer, the relative wage is getting higher, both in the US and in Mexico. But the actuary model would predict that only high skilled workers in the US would be better off, and high skilled workers in Mexico should be worse off, as Mexico specializes in low skill intensive goods. So, is trade now responsible for the rise in income inequality? since our model does not uh, match that? Well, that is the answer that a lot of people uh, in the uh, 90s had. It wasn't about trade, it was about technology. And so the 90s are also the years of the computer. And uh, you can think that the computer is a skilled bias technological change. In other words, is a technological change that discriminates between workers, that increases the productivity only of a particular group of workers. Right? So uh, the computers in the 90s was a, 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 a technological change that was biased towards high skilled workers. So if the computer goes to high skilled workers and increases their productivity, the relative wage will increase. Okay? And if computers are spread all over the world, can think that that's will, that will happen everywhere, okay? Now, we clearly saw uh, during last year and this year during the lockdowns, what skilled bias technologies are. You can think of Zoom, you can think of these video recordings that I'm doing. This is a technology that increases my productivity right, relative to a scenario in which, I don't know how, we could have done any lectures. I probably would have just phoned you uh, if uh, this lockdown happened in the 80s. I don't know, right? But obviously Zoom is uh, a technology that increases the productivity of high skilled workers, allows me to do the lectures, allows managers, uh, finance people, uh, engineers, uh, software developers to meet online, but it does nothing for the productivity of uh, low skilled workers. Right? simply because you cannot do a lot of low-skill activities on Zoom. You cannot do uh, deliver food. You cannot uh, be a waiter. You cannot cut hair. You cannot do any of those sort of low-skill activities. Okay. Now, here's a quick example of a skill bias technical change that we all know, which is the ATM. Right? Before the ATM machine, the only way to get cash was to get inside the bank to the bank tellers and ask them for cash. Now there is a machine that does that. And what was the result? Well, this is data for Denmark. That's why I'm talking about it. And it's exactly in the period that more or less we're looking at, 94, 2014. As you can see, the number of bank tellers has been declining because as they, they've been, uh, their activities have been uh, automated by the ATM. Right, so that means uh, low skilled workers, in this example, bank tellers are gonna be worse off. Uh, but, you know, first of all, that doesn't mean that there's, there is gonna be unemployment, especially in the long run. And second, uh, it doesn't mean that only the ATM owners are gonna be better off. Because what happened was that the number of bank advisors in the uh, ranking of activities within a bank, obviously a higher skill required to, do a to be a bank advisor than a bank teller. Well, the number of bank tellers have been, sorry, the, the number of bank advisors have been steadily increasing. Right? So almost that the numbers net out, okay? Okay, so uh, is this it? Is the reason why income inequality in the US and Mexico has increased uh, is technology? Could certainly be. Another possible reason is a policy. I, we saw in the actual lecture that the progressivity of the taxation system can uh, 
dampen inequality, so if there are changes in the regard, inequality can change, right? But overall, it really looks like international trade is not responsible for what was going on in the US and Mexico. Or at least until Finstra Hanson in 96 came with their model of offshoring and with their evidence. We're gonna have two countries again, home and foreign. We're gonna have uh, a continuum of inputs to produce a finer good. Okay. Why a continuum? Well, just because uh, uh, analytically that's much easier that, than using a discrete and uh, arbitrary number of intermediate goods. Now these inputs are indexed by Z from zero to one. Okay? You know, if you have a lot of intermediate inputs, like in the iPad, uh, well, it's not such a crazy idea to think that they can be approximated by a continuum. Now, all of these intermediate inputs need to be uh, produced. We're going to have three factors of production. Skilled workers, uh, denoted by H, page, wage, Q. We're in the newer version of the textbook. Uh, uh, they use... Uh, WH, but if you use the older version, they use Q. So that's the notation that we're going to follow here. Unskill labor L is paid the wage W. And then we're also going to have capital, which is paid the rental rate R. Uh, it, it, capital is not that relevant in this particular setting. Okay. All factors can move across the inputs, but they cannot move across countries. Now, what is the technology? Well, the technology is going to be represented by unit costs, like in the actual limb model. So there's going to be a skilled labor requirements for input Z and an unskilled labor requirement for input Z. So AH is the number of workers you need to produce one unit of input Z and AL is the number of low skilled workers you need to produce one unit of input Z. We're going to list, we're going to rank order intermediate inputs Z by their high skill intensity. In other words, we're going to assume that, uh, uh, we're going to assume, we're going to make sure that input Z's are ordered from zero to one so that the ratio AH over AL is increasing in Z. So that the relative number of high skill workers per low skill workers is increasing in Z. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, typically, when we think about uh, uh, the production of a process, chronologically speaking, you use uh, first research and development, you produce the components, then you assemble them, and you finish with the marketing and sales activities. All right, so that's the activities that are ranked by order of production. What we're going to do in this model is rank them by high skill intensity. So you can think that we start with assembly, the most low skill intensive activity. Then we have component production, the sort of a little bit more high skill intensive, marketing and sales, and R&D. So these are the uh, intermediate inputs that need to be produced. You need one unit of each intermediate input, and then these things are combined together, or sort of assembled together in the home economy. What are the unit costs equal to? Well, we're going to assume this functional form, where the cost for intermediate input Z, which depends on the factors of prices, we're going to have a B, which is uh, just a shifter, can think of it as the inverse of uh, total factor productivity. Then we have this sort of Cobb Douglas aggregation of the labor costs to the power of theta and the rental on capital to the power of one minus theta. And uh, the labor cost is simply the summation of W times the labor requirement for low skills and Q times high skill labor requirement going to be the same technology across countries. Okay, so you can think of this as a firm offshoring part of its production processes and using the same uh, technology that it would use at home. 
And this is also similar to the actual lean model where technology is the same. We're gonna assume though that factor prices are different. In particular, Q over W is gonna be less than Q star over W star. So managers in the US are relatively cheaper than in Mexico. Does that make sense? Well, let's look at the data. Well, this is the figure for uh, basically Q over W in the US and non production workers over production workers in the US is Q over W. And, and so, what, this, what is the relative wage equal to? Well, it equals to something between 1.5 and 1.8, right? What about in Mexico? Well, in Mexico, it goes uh, from uh, or less one, almost 1 1.8, right, which is the highest possible in the US uh, at the end of this period, to 3.1. So Q over W in Mexico is much higher than it is in the US. So this assumption is uh, uh, taken from the data. And uh, you know, what this is saying is basically that if you, you know, if you have a budget for hiring workers, for every high skilled worker you hire in, in the US, you're giving up way less low skilled workers than uh, if you were doing the same thing in Mexico. Yeah. And so uh, that's the assumption that we're gonna make. And then we're also going to assume that the rental on capital is lower at home than it is abroad. You know, perhaps this is because uh, you can think that the home economy is also capital abundant. And so there is more uh, capital per worker than abroad. And so that's why the rental on capital at home is lower. And so ideally the home capital would like to move abroad to the foreign economy. Now, Given these assumptions, the objective now is to figure out where we're gonna produce the intermediate inputs. Our objective is to figure out the location of production for each intermediate input Z. Now, this is fairly intuitive. Uh, we have to compare the unit cost per input Z and uh, in the two locations, home and foreign. And uh, if the unit cost is higher in the home economy, well, then we're gonna produce the intermediate input abroad and vice versa. So if we think in terms of ratio of unit costs, we can write that if the ratio of unit cost, home versus foreign. So C of W, Q, R, Z, divided by C and W star, Q star, R star of Z, is greater than one, well then produce Z in the foreign economy. Instead, if the ratio of unit cost is less than one, so C of Z allow me here to drop the various arguments to his notation. And let me write the foreign cost as C star of Z. If this is less than one, then we produce Z at home. And of course, if the ratio of unit costs equals to one, well then we are indifferent 
Okay, so this is fairly straightforward and makes a lot the, uh, a great deal of sense. But what we need to do now is to do something more systematic. Right? So we know that the input z go from uh, zero to one. What we want to establish is whether there is uh, an area, uh, a segment. Uh, within the interval such that the home economy produces that segment and the foreign economy produces the other one. A way to uh, do this is to study how the ratio of unit costs vary with Z. Right? So you say the ratio of unit cost uh, uh, increases in Z, well then so long as uh, uh, the ratio of unit cost is below one, you produce first at home, and then since the ratio of unit cost is increasing in Z, after it passes one, you produce the remainder of inputs abroad. And vice versa, if the ratio of unit cost decreases in Z, that means that the first part of the intermediate input Z are produced abroad, and the second part, or the latter part, are produced at home. So what we want to do now is to actually study whether the ratio of unit cost increases or decreases in Z. So whether the ratio of unit cost is increasing or decreasing in Z. So whether the derivative of the ratio of unit cost with respect to Z is positive or negative. So to do that, let me first rewrite quickly the uh, unit cost formula. Now, the first thing we want to do is to take the ratio of the two unit costs. So C over C star Z equals, well, first of all, the B's cancel out. And then we have this long ratio of AL ZW plus AH ZQ. And all of this is divided by the equivalent term in the foreign economy. ALZW star plus AHZW star. And now this is to the power of theta. And then we have the ratio of the rental on capital in the two economies, so R over R star to the power of one minus theta. Now, when you look at this, equation, you want to, you know, that you need to take the derivative of the unit cost with respect to Z, but you realize that the uh, intermediate input Z enters the unit high skill level requirement AH and the unit low skill level requirement AL. Right, so that seems straightforward enough, right? You take the derivative and you solve the algebra, depending on whether AL increases in Z or AH increases in Z, you can figure out what's going to happen to the unit, uh, to the ratio of unit cost. Uh, that makes sense, but we also have to remember what type of information we have available. We don't know what is the uh, form or shape or anything of AL or AH. What we know is that the ratio of the two, AH over AL, is strictly increasing in Z. But what this is saying is that uh, the intermediate input Zs are ordered so that the uh, initial Z is the highest uh, low skill intensity and uh, Z equals to one is the one with the highest high skill intensity. 
So since we know that the ratio is increasing, but we don't really know anything about the uh, AL and AH separately, it is convenient to rewrite the unit cost function, the ratio of the unit costs, as a function of the ratio. And so basically we factor out AL both at the numerator and at the denominator of this parenthesis. Okay. So what do we obtain then? Well, we obtain that the ratio of CZ over CZ star, C star Z, equals W plus A H Z over A L Z Q divided by W star plus A H Z over A L Z times Q star. This is to the power of theta, and then we have the ratio of the rental on capital R over R star to the power of one minus theta. Now, obviously, uh, all that matters for us is to study the sign of this term here. And so that's what we're going to do now. We take the derivative of W plus AH over AL, both a function of Z, times Q, divided by W star plus AH over AL, Z, and Q star. And we take the derivative of this term with respect to Z. And so what do we get? Well, let's use the quotient the ratio rule. Start with the derivative of the a numerator, so we have a Q, we have the derivative of the A, H over A, L, but I'll, I'll write it out uh, afterwards. Q times W star plus A, H over A, L, Z. Q, Q star. And then we have minus WQ star minus AHZ ALZ Q, Q star. All of this is multiplied by the derivative of AH over AL. with respect to z, and all of this is divided by the denominator to the power of 2. Excellent. So when we look at this um, formula, what do we obtain is, well, these terms cancel out. And so we can rewrite everything as follows. <clears throat> 
And so what do we have here? Well, we have that the denominator is obviously positive, right? Because it's raised to the power of two. And then, I mean, in generally, in general, we know that W star and Q star are uh, positive uh, numbers. And so are the A, A L and A H, so this is positive. We know that the derivative of the ratio of uh, high skill requirements over low skill requirements is also increasing in Z. So this term is positive. And so to establish whether the term we're interested in here, or whether this term is positive or negative, which is basically gonna tell us whether the unit cost is increasing or decreasing in Z, well, what we have to do is to figure out what this uh, difference here, Q W star minus W Q star equals to, whether or rather, whether that thing is positive or negative. So now to see whether that's positive or negative, recall that we have assumed Right, so we assume that the home economy relative high skill wage Q over W is less than the relative high skill wage in the foreign economy. And this uh, is uh, straight from the data, right? We saw that the relative uh, wage of uh, non-production workers to production workers in the US was lower than the ratio of the average wage of the non-production workers to production workers in Mexico. So, I mean, it is straightforward to show that given this assumption, the term that we had there, where over here, is actually negative. Now, why is that? Well, let me rewrite it here. QW star minus W Q star is actually equal to here, the way to quickly do that is to factor out both uh, wages, W, W star. What we have is that Q over W minus Q star over W star, which of course is less than zero. All right. So since this term is less than zero and all the other terms in these derivatives are actually positive, the derivative we started with is actually neg uh, negative. Right, so we've shown that uh, this term that I'm highlighting has a negative derivative with respect to Z. This also means that the derivative of the ratio of unit cost C over C star with respect to Z is less than zero. So this means that the uh, initial activities are such that the unit cost is higher in uh, the home economy than it is abroad. And then as we uh, move along the ranking of intermediate inputs, those become uh, cheaper and cheaper to produce at home. I mean, this makes sense, right? We saw, we said that the home economy has a, a relatively lower high skill wage relative to low skill labor, relative to the foreign economy. And so it is not a surprise that in the home economy, it is the high skill intensive intermediate inputs, which are the cheapest to produce, okay? And so we can uh, actually draw our uh, ratio of unit cost on a plane in which the horizontal axis is uh, Z. The vertical axis is the ratio of the two unit costs. So what we have here is some declining function uh, from zero to one. Okay, 
And so the initial activities, so let's say that the ratio of unit cost equals one in this horizontal uh, line. Well, what we're saying is that at the beginning, the unit costs are higher in the foreign econ in the home economy relative to the foreign economy. So you will make this stuff abroad. Whereas at the end of the uh, ranking of intermediate inputs, uh, where we have the most high skill intensive uh, inputs, well, in the case, the unit costs are lower at home than they are abroad, and hence you will produce that at home. So what we've established uh, in this uh, simple, taking the simple derivative is that the intermediate inputs, there are relatively more low skill intensive are made abroad where low skilled workers are relatively cheaper. Right? That makes sense. Similarly, the high skill intensive activities are made at home where high skilled workers are relatively cheaper. Here we have the same figure on the slide. We have this declining function of the two uh, unit costs, the ratio of the two unit costs, where the function uh, crosses the horizontal line uh, at one, uh, that is the case in which uh, the two unit costs are equal to one another. Here there is an inter, uh, a, a borderline uh, intermediate input Z prime, uh, which uh, such that from zero to Z prime, Intermediate inputs are produced abroad, and from Z prime to uh, one, intermediate inputs are produced at home. Now, what if there is an increase in offshore? What does that mean? Well, that means that the uh, relative cost curve is going to shift to the right. Why is that? Well, a way to think about it is that all of a sudden we allow for capital to move. If capital moves from home to foreign, because at home it has a lower rental rate and abroad it has the higher rental rate, you can think that by going abroad, it reduces the marginal product of capital, it increases the marginal product of the other factors, but by reducing the marginal product of capital, R star declines, and therefore you're going to reduce your unique costs, okay? Now, you don't need to uh, worry too much about that because in this model, really, what we care about is to study what happens when Z prime increases and goes from Z prime to Z double prime. This is an increase in offshoring because foreign used to produce from zero to Z prime and now produces from zero to Z double prime. Home instead shrinks its production in uh, in that it used to produce from Z prime to one and now it produces from Z double prime to one. So what does that mean for the high skill intensity of the two countries? And so for the average high skill intensity of the intermediate inputs produced in the two countries. Well, inputs become more skill intensive in the foreign economy. And that makes sense. I mean, you used to produce from zero to Z prime. Now you add a bunch of intermediate inputs, which are uh, which have higher Z, so they have higher high skill intensity. So it makes sense that the average high skill intensity of the foreign economy increases. But what I claim here is that this also occurs for the home economy. And this is the twist. This is the key difference with the actual lean model. You know, in the actual lean model, uh, what we would have had is that one country becomes more high skill intensive and the other becomes low skill intensive, right? So because they shift their production towards one country, the high skill intensive input and the other the low skill intensive input. But in this case, that doesn't happen. Both countries become 
the production in both countries become relatively more high skill intensive. And you can see the home economy that basically the home economy used to make from Z prime to one. And now it's given up a bunch of intermediate inputs, which are of relatively low skill for the home economy. And the home economy is left with producing only the highest high skill intensive inputs. Right, so inputs become more skill intensive on average in both countries. If you think about it in terms of uh, tasks, in terms of uh, this uh, representative inputs, this to be a Z prime. When we move to Z double prime, basically what's happening is that you shift marketing and sales to Mexico. Mexico used to make uh, only assembly and components. Now it also does some marketing activities, which is relatively more high skill intensive. And so production in Mexico become relatively more high skill intensive. The home economy instead gives up marketing and sales. But since the home economy was producing marketing and R&D, and is now left with just R&D, the relative, the average high skill intensity of the home economy has also increased. So if the high skill intensity increases in both economies, if you need to produce intermediate inputs, which relative to, to before are on average more high skill intensive, well, you're gonna need some high skill workers, right? So your demand for high skill workers increases in both countries. What does that mean? Well, here we have uh, the plot at home and abroad of the relative demand for high skill workers, ID of Z prime, because it's a function of the borderline input Z prime. And here we have a, a inelastic supply. So what we, what we have here? Well, if you can see here that I'm drawing is so that the relative wage of high skilled workers is higher abroad than at home. If Z prime increases, both countries become more high skill intensive, at least their production, because they start producing relatively more on average high skill inputs. You need high skilled workers in both economies. So the relative demand for high skilled workers increases. And so the relative wage of high skilled workers increases in both economies. Excellent. This is what we were looking for. And this is the key difference between this model and the model of offshoring. The model of Exurolin. Because this can indeed rationalize the fact that high skilled workers have become richer in the US between 85 and uh, the early 2000. And the same thing happened in Mexico. Okay. So what Finstra Hanson did was to provide a rationale for why actually offshoring this new form of international trade was responsible for the increase in income inequality, both in Mexico and in the US. So what they provided was a competing uh, theory uh, with respect to technology. Now, we saw before that technology can also explain the increase in income inequality. So what also Finstra Hanson do in their paper, they also uh, do an empirical analysis to study how much offshoring and technology, in particular computers, explain of the rising income inequality between the US and Mexico, and they find that they both account for about 50% of the rising income inequality. Okay. So that is probably the largest effect of offshoring that I've seen in the literature. Okay. And it applies for this you know, period between the US and Mexico. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Ciao.